So I want to talk about intellectual asset management because that's really going to set the context about why um, we have intellectual, well, part of why we have an intellectual property policy and the value of it. So we'll talk about what is tech transfer. Um, what does this office do that's putting on the symposium today? Why do we explore these areas? Um, and a little bit about our office. And then tools that we use at the university for management of intellectual assets. And that will lead us into the, the IP policy. And then I can give you some relevant examples at the university. And then um, these presentations will be made available, both the recordings as well as copies of the PowerPoints. They'll be made available online afterwards. And so there will be a resource list as well. So really, why do we care at the university about intellectual asset management? And some of you have seen me speak before, so you're going to recognize a few slides and bear with me. But one of the best stories that I can use to illustrate universities, intellectual asset management, and the relationship to the endeavors of the, the research enterprise is uh, vitamin D. So if you go back to 1923, Dr. Harry Steenbach is a biochemistry faculty member at the University of Wisconsin at Madison. And he realized that if you irradiate foods, and later we figured that he did it in milk as well, that you could increase the concentration of vitamin D. And it had been shown by then that increasing the concentration of vitamin D, or um, excuse me, that vitamin D could cure rickets, which was a huge problem in the childhood population. So if you irradiated food, increase the concentration of vitamin D, this is a great way to treat an, a, you know, a very large population in the United States for a very serious health concern. He had had a colleague who, earlier than that, had developed a test that determined the percentage of butter fat in milk, which was um, something you had to do before you sold milk. His colleague just wanted to make this test freely available because it was so valuable for the milk industry and for consumers. He made it freely available, but what happened ultimately was that kind of any company could go take the test and develop a product or a service around it, and it lost its value because it was hard to know who had standardized the test, who was using controls, what the validity of the results meant, to the extent that the government had to come in and start regulating use of the test again. He didn't want, he knew that what, uh, Steenbach knew that what he was doing was very important and he didn't want that to happen. It's what I talk now about, we don't want to dilute the value of the research that creates the innovation. So he patented himself, um, his $300, and then he said to the university, I want you to manage this patent. I think it's only appropriate, you know, I did my research here, I'm part of this community and part of your, your mission, I want you to take control of it. So the university approached nine alums, they each put in $100, and they um, started the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation in 1925, which is WARF. And really, it's, it's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, tech transfer office um, in the United States. So there has been a long history about vitamin D. That innovation was ultimately licensed to Quaker Oats. Um, they used it for food. They used it for milk. Um, there has been uh, generations of technologies related to that original finding. And now, in, uh, or as of 2014, Wharf has a $2.6 billion endowment, and they contribute over $70 million annually to University of Wisconsin-Madison for research efforts. 70% of that income is coming from vitamin D. So it's a really good and powerful story about knowing what you're doing within your enterprise and the value that it can represent, how to manage those assets to best benefit entire communities, both those that created it as well as those who benefit from it. So if we look at tech transfer using Wikipedia's very scientific definition, but it's still very meaningful. You're transferring skills and knowledge and things um, to other governments, facilities, universities, and users to ensure that scientific and technological developments are accessible to a wide range of users. And I think that's the key thing. One of the things that we can, well, I'm going to get ahead of myself. So there's a definition that I like to work with. And technology transfer, it's both looking inside as well as outside of the university. So within the university, we talk about a service to faculty. And I should include in here our staff and our students as well and is looking at their innovations and their efforts and how we can help to um, manage perhaps elements of it that can give it a broader implication as well as potential for further development. Service to the public, maybe bringing new products or goods or services to the market. Economic development, where we can support startups. Technology-based economic development is a very popular word. So if we can have startups that contribute to our regional economy, um, that's something that we can play a role in. 
revenue generation from licensing and royalties that come off of the intellectual assets, and then compliance as well. We have to make sure that we have compliance with things like the Bayh-Dole Act, which I'll go into more detail. It's federal legislation um, that tells what we have to do about our intellectual property when inventions are made, as well as the policies that embody our ability to provide those services. So technology transfer at UNH is embodied in our mission statement, which is that we are serving New Hampshire and the region through education, cooperative extension, economic development activities, and applied research. And that translates for our office directly into outreach. We are a way that we can help transfer the information and the developments made at the university to larger communities. So facilitating the, facilitating the availability of our research and knowledge for consumption by larger audiences. But importantly, it's to maintain the fidelity to the research that created it. So what I mean by that is it's very common for our researchers to be presenting at conferences, to be publishing in peer-reviewed journals, and that is one level of dissemination of that information and making a connection. But there has to be another level that translates that into goods or services, when appropriate and when applicable, into goods and services that can be utilized by larger communities. Technology transfer is a method by facilitating that. But when we do it, we want to make sure that the research and the value of that research that created it is held true so that you don't dilute the value and the end product really embodies some very hard-earned information and you have to keep those connected. And as well, our efforts are about the UNH Research Enterprise brand. So the university is known for its education services, but we also have a very phenomenal research initiative that um, we've been investing heavily into, and technology transfer is a way to contribute to that brand. So when we talk about intellectual asset management, we're looking at how do we derive maximum benefit from that knowledge. Now in our office, we are working with UNH's faculty, staff, and students um, in the course of their research. It could be when they have an idea, maybe they've had funding or they've worked with a partner, they've created something, um, and then the question is, what, what next? So our general process to work with um, our community is to identify what are the intellectual assets, and really that's half the battle, and I think we've been hearing that throughout the morning sessions. You need to know what you have and what you're working with. So identifying your intellectual assets evaluating them, what's the market out there? Who might be interested? Who could benefit from this? Um, how might it best be s delivered to them? Is it through a Creative Commons or an open source license? Or is it through perhaps a traditional license of the technology and somebody else makes it into a consumer good or service? Um, keeping that in mind, what, what, um, what IP rights are available for us to use for protecting it, and then what makes sense for the business case of, of the innovation, what you're trying to do. So maybe it's patentable, but pursuing a patent is expensive, and you wouldn't recoup that investment. Or maybe you know that a trademark would be really critical um, to, to pursue, because this is part of the brand of the product. So then protection, um, those are the different categories that we roughly divvy up our innovations into. Commercialization. I'll show you that we have a continuum of options, and the commercialization is the step that we make our innovation available to these larger audiences. And then management, management of relationships, both internally and externally, management of licenses, management of our intellectual asset program. So there's a continuum of options when it comes to commercialization. You might think that this is just about finding um, a licensee, having them pay a license fee, they have exclusive rights to our innovation, they're going to pay us royalties, and that's kind of it. And sometimes that is the best model, and, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I'll show you from the IP policy that we use those royalties to invest in our, invest, in our investigators as well as into our research enterprise. But other times that's just the absolute worst thing that we could do for that innovation. And so we need to think what's appropriate. And if the Supreme Court says you can look at your case, you know, you look at your, um, the cases case by case, the, I would say the same thing when it comes to the innovations that come through our office. Each one has to be evaluated for what's the best business case. And that includes what's best for the researcher, what's best for the utilization of the innovation. 
And I'm being very careful to talk about innovations. I want you to know that this refers to everything that gets created at the university, whether it's something out of our College of Liberal Arts or Health and Human Services, or maybe it's a, a traditional widget or a patentable invention that's coming out of engineering and physical sciences. These are all the innovations and the intellectual assets that we manage. So we have done all of this. We've done Creative Commons licenses. We've done um, picking the right open source license. You know, their attribution is probably the most critical element to us. We want our innovators' names to be continually associated with these products of high quality. Um, copyright and trademark licenses. We have patentable innovations that we don't pursue patent protection, but we can still license. And then patented innovations. And these are some examples um, that go through that whole continuum and they're different, they represent um, interest across the entire university. So all of that is a lead up into what are the tools that we use. So I, I wanted to tell you about intellectual asset management, why do universities care about it, how UNH views intellectual asset management and the value that it brings and what our office does um, in its role for the support of intellectual asset management. So now I want to switch into getting to the IP policy. What are the tools that we have available to us for intellectual asset management at UNH. And it goes back to 1980, to the Bayh-Dole Act. So this is federal legislation. It's sometimes called the Patent and Trademark Law Amendments Act. Um, you know, Bayh-Dole just slips off a lot easier from, from the tongue. And it's to deal with patentable intellectual property that comes out of government-funded research. So prior to 1980, if the government, for example, the National Science Foundation or the National Institutes of Health, if they were to fund research, patentable inventions that came out of that, the government would take title to those inventions. What happened was we were saying, okay, this isn't working. The government had, I think the number I saw was like 28,000 patents that were just sitting there. They really weren't able to do much with them. That's a huge volume. And so um, senators by and Dole said, not working. We've got to think about something different. And they wanted to make the U.S. more competitive on the global marketplace. And they said one of the ways that we can do this is instead of the government taking title, when we pass the Bayh-Dole Act, now we enable those parties that receive the federal funds to conduct the research, they are the ones who are going to take title to patentable inventions that arise from the research. So post-1980, um, Bayh-Dole permits a university, small business, or nonprofit institution to elect to take title to patentable inventions. And I keep emphasizing that this doesn't deal with copyrights or trademarks. It's debatable about whether it deals with software. Most universities will lump software in as potentially patentable and just to be on the safe side. But what universities have done to translate the Bayh-Dole Act into their practices and policies is to use that as the guidance for all, usually to use that as the guidance for all forms of innovations, patentable or not. So there's a whole list about the Bayh-Dole Act, about what it does, and it really dictates. Um, well, one I should mention, this set up, this caused a lot of tech transfer offices to be established. Um, they might have been able to manage some of the elements through the efforts of other departments on campus, but many universities realized that they need a dedicated party um, once the Bayh-Dole Act was passed. For us, um, our office wasn't really established till 2000, so we, we, you know, about 20 years later, this became a pressing need. Um, but what the Bayh-Dole Act is, it says, utilize the inventions. You know, uh, disclose to us what you have. Tell us if you're going to take title or not. If you're not going to take title, it's going to revert back to the f to the federal funding agency. If you're going to take title, do something with it. So tell and then tell us what you're going to do. And what they want you to do is to find a licensee. You know, most universities are not and should not be in the business of commercializing their innovations. That really de takes away limited resources from what we excel at, the education and the research and the outreach. So find, um, you are now enabled to take title, and now we want you to find a way to get this out to larger um, audiences, to, the, to a consumer population, for example. So you can enter into exclusive licenses or non-exclusive licenses with licensees. The government receives um, a perpetual, non-exclusive, royalty-free license to use the innovation for their own purposes. I haven't read about any situations where this has caused any company great harm or influenced their ability to commercialize it themselves, but you need to know that. Um, we have to follow a process by which we keep our federal funding agency informed, and we have to include certain stipulations in our license 
based on the federal funding. Um, for example, the licensee has to actively commercialize it. They can't just license it to let it sit on the shelf or remove it from competition from others. So we have to express that. We want manufacturing, if there's any manufacturing involved in commercialization, to be done largely in the United States. It comes out of the Bayh-Dole Act. If that's not possible, then we have to seek an exception from the government. So the Bayh-Dole Act sets up a lot of tech transfer offices. It's going to influence the IP policy that I will show you. And it, has, um, it, it helps to frame the licenses that we use to commercialize our, our intellectual assets. So really looking internally about the effects of the Bayh-Dole Act, other than just granting us the right to take um, title to our inventions now, the Bayh-Dole Act says to the university or those who are t have taken title, if you make money, your inventor has to make money. Um, so you, we, need to be, we, ha we need a provision to share royalties with the inventors. Now here I'm saying inventor because the Bayh-Dole Act is patentable inventions. But in our IP policy, we broaden this to talk about our innovators because we want this to be the standard across the entire university. Uh, that which we don't share with the inventor, and the Bayh-Dole Act doesn't tell us how much. It just says, you know, come up with a policy. The rest is to, um, to support scientific research or education. And we have to have um, a requirement that, in writing, our employees are going to promptly disclose to us any inventions that are made. This puts a huge education component to the activities out of our office. Um, so it's not atypical for perhaps faculty and staff to not understand that, um, that they have to disclose any inventions that are made with federal funding. They might think it's a choice whether or not they're interested in this whole tech transfer stuff or this whole commercialization world, but this is a requirement. By virtue of the university accepting money from the federal government, we tell them that we, yes, we absolutely will disclose to you if we have patentable inventions, and that's very important. Yes. So if a faculty member has uh, a mix of funding, which yes. is going into a potential invention, yes. then how is that? It's still managed as if it were exclusively funded by the federal government. That's a really good question. So as you know, kind of our mantra is, as long as there is one federal dollar in the invention, by dole applies. So that leads us to the IP policy. Now you know some of the things that we have to embody, and I've already given you the disclosure about how we apply it broadly across the whole university. As far as I can tell, our first IP policy was around 1990, and it went a very long time without getting touched. Um, there was an attempt at a revision at one point. It never made it all the way through the approval stages. So it wasn't until 2006 that we had a really significant revision of the IP policy. And by then, we had a lot more data points to look at. How did other universities and how did our peer institutions treat their intellectual property and what did their policies look like? So doing a lot of research and a lot of legwork into those questions, we had this huge revision of the IP policy. We clarified about students having rights to the intellectual property that they create, and then, as well as how the university is going to approach commercialization of um, works developed at the university. And then just in 2014, we had another revision of the IP policy. It's not nearly as drastic. It really looks um, very similar. But I think it's important because we did a lot of clarification. We were trying to be um, sensitive to the other policies that are related to make sure we had consistency, even just in vocabulary terms. Um, it's very difficult to say, you know, these three policies all have an influence on what I'm trying to do, but they approach the same topic slightly differently, and that's not helpful. So we've worked on that. We spent some more time talking about exempted scholarly works and ownership. Um, more about the student IP ownership because that's very important and our students are very savvy about intellectual property. Um, and I think one of the, the key things is that we've improved what happens if the university elects to not pursue um, an innovation that's brought to us. So what I want to do now is, um, hopefully I've set the stage for you, I thought we could go through elements of the IP policy that might be of most interest. And you have copies in front of you if you want the long text. Um, I'll summarize, and then if you have questions along the way, please ask. So, or if you have specific examples, um, I'd love to entertain those so we can have a discussion about it. One of the things, 
if you get to take pride in a policy, one of the things I'm very proud about the UNHIP policy is that we treat the entire university community the same. So we, um, yes, and there are more copies too in the back somewhere. Maybe they're on the table. But um, so we talk about all members of the university community, and we do not distinguish if you are a faculty, a staff, a student, administrator. Um, you should note that this includes postdocs as well as um, visiting scholars. Other institutions will say faculty have one treatment of their intellectual property and staff have another because they look at the work for hire situation differently. But here at the university, in my mind, everybody's treated the same because everybody's work is acknowledged as being very critical to our research enterprise. I look mostly at research. The policy applies regardless of the source of support for the research or scholarly activity. So whether you um, perhaps are maybe in the English department where you're likely not going to have a federal funding source. Um, you might not have any grants um, that you are using for your research or if you're in Earth, Oceans, and Space and you have NASA funding. Regardless, the IP policy applies to everybody. And then finally, the policy, you know, there's a lot to it, but it's not to be construed to limit the right of any member of the university community to conduct their research or scholarly work. This is a tool that we use to protect the interests of our innovators, of the university, to establish relationships, and for our intellectual asset management strategy. So section six is about who owns what, because this, you know, this is often the first question. Do I own it? Do you own it? Why? And what we say is a covered individual, that group that we identified on the previous slide, they shall own all IP discovered, created, or developed unless. So if the IP is developed while conducting your um, employment responsibilities, you know, why you were hired, then the university will own it. So for example, um, I created this PowerPoint presentation, but you'll see in my copyright notice that I have the University of New Hampshire's name. I am the author of this PowerPoint presentation, and I've represented that on the first slide. I don't own it because this is one of the you know, many fun things that UNH pays me to do. This is part of my employment responsibilities. So while conducting university duties for which you're employed, and employed is a broad definition here, receives salaries, wages, stipends, or grant funds. If the IP results from making use of university resources, the university will own the intellectual property. This is not making use of the library or your computers. This is making use of resources not available to the general public. It's really you know, easy if you start thinking about our, our, our Cray computer or our NMRs and other high-end, high high-quality, very expensive pieces of equipment. For example, those would not be available to the public. Use of those in creating IP, UNH will own the IP. And then if there is a legal obligation, we've entered into a sponsored research agreement or there's a federal funding um, element to it. Uh, there might be a material transfer agreement that had IP ownership terms. So those will influence the ownership of any IP that's created. So for example, if you receive a grant or you have a contract or a foundation is supporting your research, the university administers those funds. And so that falls right into this category about any IP that comes out of it, the university will have ownership to it. We have a group, uh, or a category of intellectual property called exempted scholarly works, and I'll go into more detail because this is very important. And you should know that if, even if, um, when the university has ownership rights to IP, but it's also an exempted scholarly work, the university will waive its ownership right in favor of the creator of it. So we'll, we'll get to that momentarily. When it comes to graduate students, it's really not, not that different, but we have called it out specifically so we can look at those examples. And I think you can see how it follows along the same lines, but I want to point out this one right here because I think that has a little bit of a different flavor to it, which is that if the graduate student is involved in IP that's developed from work performed under a grant or other sponsorship or undertaken with other covered individuals who have a duty to make assignment to the university. Sometimes we have gotten to gray areas, and this is really intended to, to reflect that. And you know, typically, the other covered individual could be their thesis advisor, for example. Important for the graduate students, any theses or dissertations or other derivatives of those works, you know, the embodiment of their graduate career, those are exempted scholarly works, and the graduate students are going to retain um, or ownership any ownership by the university will be waived so that the graduate student will have ownership of those works. 
So when they want to go publish on their thesis or to have it included, the University of Michigan has some cataloging for theses, then they can go do that independently because we've waived our ownership rights. And then the last category are for undergraduate students. And again, it's really the same criteria. So where this, this starts, or I guess where, where it stems from is if you have a student who is enrolled in a class and they create some element of intellectual property, of course their copyrights just from the assignments they might create, um, but it could be more, for example, our senior engineering students working on their capstones. Any IP that they create for their course assignment, unless it was grant funded, for example, then the students own the intellectual property rights to it. A very basic situation that's come up repeatedly is a department will say, we retain copies of our students' assignments because when we go through our accreditation process, we want to be able to include that in the application. Those departments cannot do so unless they have received permission from the students because the students own the copyrights to those assignments. Or a faculty member says, I want to retain copies so that I can post the student's work from this semester to show my incoming class the example of the portfolio that they will be creating over the course of the semester. They cannot do that unless they receive written permission from the students. So this isn't done out of maliciousness, it's just you know, not really appreciating the rights of the undergraduate students. If the students are working in somebody's lab and there's a grant funding the research, even if the student's not paid off the grant but they're just using the, you know, the grant funding for the research, then in those examples, the university will own intellectual property that's created. Lindsay? Quick question about the C-Comp group. A lot of them are government employees. Does that override that if their thesis is that? Well, that's a nice gray area because I... <laughs> <laughs> so thanks for having that as the first question. Um, yeah, because I don't know what the written relationship is between... The, the government agency for hosting the students here and the university. If we have visiting scholars on campus, um, they are part of their agreement to be here. You know, we go through things like what happens if you were to get heard and pay and so forth. But part of it is that they have to, um, they're to sign an acknowledgement of our IP policy and that the university, because they're here making use of our resources, the university would own intellectual property. So I'm hopeful that there's a nice agreement that's constructed that relationship and would be our reference point. But I don't know for sure. Um, okay, so that's who owns what and, and kind of when and where. Um, the next is the, the, the exempted scholarly works. And this is just, it's, it's so important. Um, I find it difficult to find a great definition of exempted scholarly works but you kind of know by gut instinct what they were intended to be. You know, so this is to represent what, what your faculty were, were supposed to do. They're supposed to be writing and expressing ideas and communicating with um, fellow scholars. So what we do for exempted scholarly works is we've, we've listed this as our uh, categorization. Next time we go through revision, I wouldn't be surprised if we're able to fine tune this even more as we gain more experience. But for example, traditional publications in academia, if you write a textbook, if you're ready to submit your scholarly article for um, a peer-reviewed journal, if you create tools for a class that you're teaching, these are all exempted scholarly works. What happens with them is that the university, if the university has ownership rights, because you look at section six and it fits in those categories, one of those categories, if we have ownership rights and it's an exempted scholarly work, we waive our ownership rights in favor of the author or creator. So that's what enables a, um, an author, for example, to enter directly and personally into a contract with a publisher for their work because we don't have the ownership rights. We've waived it. Um, we, we can't formally advise anybody reviewing a, a publishing agreement um, because it's going to be a personal agreement that they enter into. We can say, go to the deconstructing session right, right on the other side of the wall, but we can sit down and go through with you the terms of it and provide our insight and input about that. And that's a service that we are very glad to provide to our community. Um, the only thing that might override our ability to waive our ownership interests is if there is some pre-existing legal agreement that would prevent us from doing that. But the other thing to know is that, so we, we waive our ownership rights, but we do retain a non-exclusive, irrevocable, royalty-free license to use, display, 
and blah, 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 and so forth, for university educational and our research purposes. So we can't make money off of it, but we can use it for internal purposes with attribution. So if there's a faculty member, for example, who is on sabbatical, we can use all of their course materials and allow the, whoever is subbing in for them for that semester to utilize those materials. Or there's somebody who has created, maybe we have a TA who has created materials, and they leave, and they, they are employed by another university, and they can continue teaching a class, and they want to use those materials. They can take them with them. And they, there's no more accounting back and forth between the university and the graduate student. The materials are theirs, but we can continue to use it as well for you know, future lab sections, for example. And this is applying to instructional materials. So that's all laid out in sections 8.1 and 8.2. And um, we find that there's, there's some angst when we go through section 6 and says, yes, UNH does have you know, ownership rights to a lot of types of works. But we want you to know it's, it, it is um, compatible, completely compatible with the spirit under which you are trying to accomplish things like communicating and disseminating your findings. So then there's royalty distribution, and I mean, this is just a really good business practice, but also the Bayh-Dole Act tells us that we have to address this. So we treat all of our intellectual property the same, and what we say is that the net income received from IP is distributed according to this formula. 30% goes to the innovator, author, or developer of the intellectual asset. If there's more than one, then we share it equally unless they tell us to do it differently. And this is a personal check. You get to pay taxes on it. You get to do whatever you want with it. It's your income. That is the reward for this creative effort as well. You know, I like to view it as it takes extra effort to work with our office to see an innovation through to commercialization. And on top of everything else that our innovators are doing, it, they should be recognized for that as well and the contribution it makes to the university. 30% goes to the innovator's college or school. It goes to the dean. It's at the dean's discretion. We might say, any deans here? Any associate deans here? We might say to our innovators, you know, go, go ask them about the ability to maybe um, have some of those funds come back to your lab to continue to support the research that created this innovation. 30% goes to um, the senior vice provost for research office for, um, for institutional research initiatives. And then 10% comes to our office for administrative efforts. This is a pretty common distribution. Each university's numbers will be a little different. Some just do, um, they have a three-way distribution. Um, others have a tiered approach. So I saw one university, for the first $5,000, 100% goes to the innovator. Then after that, other groups are, take a part. Um, so you can look to see how others treat it. But this is kind of the general approach. And per the Bayh-Dole Act, it says we recognize the inventor, and then we take um, others of those royalties not shared with the inventor to support research or education purposes. Um, another critical element of the IP policy comes to us from the Bayh-Dole Act again is the acknowledgement. So it's the acknowledgement of the intellectual property policy and assignment. It's not a consent form. It doesn't say that I agree to, a, um, that you know, I, I, if I don't sign this, I'm not agreeing to the IP policy. You, know, you can't do that. If you're an employee of the university, you have to follow our policies. So it's an acknowledgment that you know what the terms say. You can't opt out of this. You can't opt out of any of the other policies as well. But you need to know what it says and what your responsibilities are, as well as um, what the university's responsibilities to you are. So it's required if you um, have any federally funded projects. When you submit the, um, the electronic routing sheet that used to be called a yellow sheet, Right? So when you go to submit your yellow sheet and that version of it, you have to have the acknowledgement on file. So if you haven't done that before, then your, your grants and contracts administrator will send you the form, you sign it, we keep it on the file, and that's your acknowledgement. You only have to do it once. You don't have to do it for each grant that you apply for. It's part of the IP policy. The change in the recent revision of the IP policy um, is reflected in this language here. It's based on um, a case that was decided by the Supreme Court a couple years ago. So it says, I hereby expressly and solely assign to the university the titles to the innovation. So it capitulates what, recapitulates what's in the IP policy. And it's also included in visiting scholar agreements. So it's important if you are hosting a visiting scholar, as well as if, for example, somebody is taking their sabbatical and there'll be a visiting scholar at another institution, to know if this will apply to them as well. 
So under our IP policy revisions, we have more clearly outlined and I think more realistically outlined what happens if we choose not to take title um, to an innovation that comes to us. So if we decide not to pursue IP rights or further commercialization, um, so we, we are not going to actively pursue it, then we're going to release the innovation to the innovator. If the innovation was federally funded, then, um, and it's, you know, it's a patentable invention, we have to actually first release it back to the federal agency, but then um, on behalf of the inventor, we can petition the agency to assign those rights to the inventor. So it's you know, a little bit of a process, but this is not atypical. Uh, what we ask is that if you make money off of it and we spend any money on protection of the innovation, then to pay us back out of those revenues. Other institutions will say if, you're going to, if we're going to, um, to transfer this back to you and we spent money on it, you have to pay us back first and then we'll release it to you. And we have gone with the approach that just says if you make money and we had already invested in the protection, then you reimburse us. Um, the innovator needs to know that they assume all personal liability at that point in commercializing innovation. The university is not you know, putting its institutional weight behind the commercialization effort. Uh, in the first bullet points, we refer to commercialization of an innovation. As yeah. But then uh, the sub bullet point says invention must be released to federal agencies. So you have innovation and invention. Yes. Well, and in <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out also if it's disclosed or non-disclosed. To, to the university? Yeah. Is, <coughs> is it published already or is it still secret information? It's disclosed to our office. Yeah. Whether or not the innovator has published any, sci you know, any articles on it or made presentations, that could be any which way. Um, so it could be that we receive an innovation and we might file, we have our, we receive an innovation. It happens to be something that is um, patentable. And our innovator, who now is an inventor because it's a patentable invention, our, our inventor is about to go publish or he's going to go make a presentation at a conference. So we decide, let's just put a provisional patent application on file so we, we can take our time and really figure out what we want to do without losing our rights. Uh, if you present your inform if if you disclose your invention, um, then you're not able to seek patent protection. So that's why I just went through that chain of events. But aside from that, so then then we do our due diligence and we looked at protectability and we look at marketability and we just don't think that there is an opportunity. It's not a good business case for the university to continue to invest in it. So at that point, we say, okay, we're going to transfer our, these rights back to you. If there was federal funding, first we have to give it then the Bayh-Dole Act kicks in, and that would be only for patentable inventions, and that's why I switched to invention in that line. But it could have been something that was more broad. It was an innovation to begin with. And then um, the inventor says, yeah, I want those rights. Sign them back to me. So we do so, and then they're able to, be, to, you know, to find a business opportunity, and they pursue it. And then if they generate revenue, they'll reimburse us for their provisional patent expenses, and then we're done. There's, there's no further relationship. However, if the inventor or the innovator, depending on what they've created, if they make further improvements or further developments at the university as part of their employment responsibilities here, then those still have to be disclosed to our office. If they take what we assigned back to them and they're personally pursuing it and in their own time, not using university resources, no, um, no university funds, and they continue to develop it, that's theirs. So it's really important to know are you doing this as an employee at the university? Are you doing this on your own? Are you segregating the resources that might help you advance it? You kind of have to compartmentalize your activities. And that's, that's pretty common, particularly if, for example, you're pursuing a startup opportunity and it's all legit and above the board, but you just have to make sure that you know um, the situation and that you're managing it. Um, so that was, that was a lot of information on that slide. Does that make sense? Yeah? No, no, it, it doesn't. Um, part of it is if it's a patentable invention because it's just hard to have the personal finances for the gamble. You know, um, for us to file a patent application, we budget seven to ten thousand dollars. 
that's that's steep, you know. And if you don't know that this is a guaranteed success or that you have a licensee or you have the ability to develop it, that can be um, a game stopper for you. If it's more of a creative work, then the risk changes. But what we find with some of our faculty, they have, for example, something that might be an exempted scholarly work. So it's not that we have to release it back, but if it's in that category. And they could, using Creative Commons licenses or traditional licenses, go d pursue their own endeavors with it. But they say, that doesn't really interest me. That's, that's administratively burdensome. It takes me away from my research. That's what I want to focus on. So they might elect to have the university to maintain its ownership right, and we will commercialize it for them. Then the distribution policy applies, and that's a happier medium because they can do what they want. So it doesn't happen tremendously, but it's a really important option. We love policies. There's, you know, there's a policy on, on making policies at UNH. And after I got the um, edits for the IP policy through, I, was, I just felt like I had years stuck out of my life. And I need to work on a few more, and I have to kind of gain the courage back up. So all I want to mention is that there are other policies that are definitely related to the idea about what are intellectual assets, um, managing your research program, um, what else? Commercializing, startup companies. So I have a list of them here, and I'm happy, happy to go through them with you at any point in time and go through them. And they are really critical. And it's, it's really interesting you know, when you kind of can piece together these various elements to really help you strateg to, um, to strategize and strongly protect your interest as an innovator as well as the university's position. And it gives us a, a, um, a game plan that we can follow. You know, this, this creates a nice roadmap once we tease apart the various elements so that you can be comfortable and confident in what you're doing and that you won't end up on the, you know, the, above the fold on the newspaper for all the wrong reasons. We have a way to manage that. So we're going to have plenty of time for questions. I do talk very fast. But I thought I could just give you um, how we apply all this. You know, what are some of the things that have happened at the university? So this is our office. Uh, some of you might have known us when we were the Office of Intellectual Property Management. Then we became the Office for Research Partnerships and Commercialization. And now we are UNH Innovation. I like to say that finally our title fits on a business card comfortably. Um, but this is what we do. We are looking at these public-private partnerships. Um, we have a, a, a role to play in contributing to the state's interest in technology-based economic development. One of our critical functions is working with sponsored programs to make sure that we are compliant with our federal obligations under Bayh Dole. We manage the IP policy. Um, we work with our innovators and our innovations, making sure that we recognize that everybody in the university has um, innovative opportunities, and we need to address all of their needs. When the office was first set up, we really focused on patents. That's pretty common. So we worked a lot with COLSA and SEPs. Now making sure we are providing services to the entire institution. If you need things like a non-disclosure agreement for confidentiality or material transfer agreement, trial agreement, if IP comes up in conversations with potential collaborators or sponsors, that's where we get involved. Um, so we provide assistance to other departments as well as ones that we're exclusively responsible for. No signing those agreements on your own. We don't want anybody personally liable. You want the institution's weight behind you on it. And then an area that we're really investing in now, and I think over the next few years you're going to see huge, huge um, advancements, is the support we can provide for entrepreneurs and for startup companies um, based on the commercialization of university-developed innovations. We have some services and some offerings, but it's going to become much more comprehensive, and that's a very exciting area for us. So if we look at our, our past year, yeah, I'm sure you can read that in the back of the room. Um, this is just summarizing where we're at. So we had about 68 disclosures last year. We're going to continue to increase that number. It's very much dependent on our research funding base. So as those numbers go up and down, then a year to three years after that, we'll see a comparable fluctuation in our numbers as well. You have to have the money to fund the innovations. Um, we don't do a tremendous amount of patenting activity unless we really feel we have an opportunity to recoup that investment. So that means we have to have a commercialization strategy at hand. So we filed last year, it was a lower number, but seven U.S. Um, applic patent applications. But we had six issue. So uh, when we do file, we're hoping that we're doing high-quality work and improving our success. 
Our office um, and the university is a little unusual. We do a lot of trademark activity. We find it's a really important way to help brand the research um, products that we have, whether they're commercialized or they're used for other purposes. And I'll show you some of those. So we did a lot of trademarks last year, both issued and filed. That number is four. Had 124 licenses that we executed. Now that number gets skewed because the IOL, has been, the Interoperability Laboratory, has been going gangbusters. And we do a lot of non-exclusive licensing of their software. One technology, many, many, many licenses. But well, that's so important because that means we have a lot of end users who are in, who are engaged with products of our. Um, research and service endeavors at the university. Last year, um, we had about $538,000 in royalties. And, okay, so it's not vitamin D, but it's still a very good indicator of the high quality work here and what we're doing. And then no startup companies, and that's just an area that we have a lot of work to do. Importantly, <laughs> over our history, the numbers are going the right way, except for startups. They are an outlier, so we're very sporadic there. But we're just continuing to see this increase in how others would evaluate our office. Who's disclosing their innovations to us? Um, are we licensing them? What type of IP rights are we trying to secure? Patents, trademarks, looking at that there. And um, how much money we're bringing into the institution. So we will never be able to influence the, the tuition rates for students. But this is money that goes to support research efforts at the, at the university. And something that's important to me, again, I know you can't read this in the back, but um, we are seeing the needle shift as to where we're getting our disclosures and where the licenses now um, are coming from. So as you can imagine, from FY 2000 to 10, we were seeing our greatest number of disclosures coming out of um, the College of Engineering and Physical Sciences, and CECOM and EOS are wrapped into that number just for reporting purposes. And that makes sense. We had a lot of federal grants going into, those, uh, into that area. So we had a lot of disclosures. Um, but, and they're still our highest, but we see in the past four years, once our office has really made a concerted effort to provide services across the entire institution, we are seeing more activity from our other colleges and other groups as well. And so for the past two years, a data point I'm very proud of is that we have had a disclosure received from every college of the UNH Durham campus. And not just SEPS, not just COLSA, or sorry, I'm using our acronyms, College of Life Sciences and Agriculture, but across the entire board. We had lots come out of UNH law last year because of the trademark. We filed um, for a number of trademark activities. And we do um, some work with UNH Manchester. That's an area we've got to do a lot more work with as well. So what are we doing? So here are some patents that we have. Um, so this first one is from Kevin Short. He is, oh, hang on one moment. I'll leave you hanging on that. Kevin is a professor in the math department, and he's uh, UNH's only Grammy winner. He had our first startup company. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, and he does work with signal processing and the chaos theory. And so around late 1990s, early 2000, we filed for a suite of patents related to his work. Um, Kevin's unusual in a lot of ways, but in one way, his patents were reviewed in record time and issued without um, much office actions, and he was not ready to start up his company yet, but all of a sudden he had an issued patent and it was time to go. So he's had a really exciting career with that. Um, we had our first design patent um, filed two years ago, I think, and this is Treese Wilcom. She's with the Occupational Therapy Department in Student Disability. It's for a tablet stand that has a lot of functionality. As you might remember from Kim's talk this morning, the design patent is for the look and feel of it, not for the utility of it. Wildcat Mandarin was um, from our plant biology department, Rosanna Fryer, a gorgeous plant. Um, her licensees were always very insistent that we have plant um, patent protection. Interestingly, we also do extensive work with Brent Loy, another member of our plant biology department. His licensees have no interest in plant patent protection. That's a tongue twister. And then um, here's another one from Jim Ryan in the Space Science Center. Jim spent years studying how to image radiation in the universe. And then he thought about how he could apply that technology to image radiation that you might find with special nuclear materials. For example, um, 
if somebody is doing a border crossing and they're trying to smuggle in uranium or something else, um, how could he apply that same technology? And that's a spectrometer, a camera um, that he's developed for those applications. Oops, too fast. So I said we do a lot of trademark activities. Um, Dot Sheehan in athletics, do you know Operation Hat Trick? Yeah, so this is our first nonprofit spin out company, and it's based on work that Dot started in athletics. Um, and Operation Hat Trick is a trademark that we've licensed to the company. It's a logo that appears on um, baseball caps, and I think soon will be other apparel as well. Universities, um, minor league teams, major league teams, they can all license um, the Operation Hat Trick. The hat's branded as their own. It has their own mascot. It has their own colors, their own name on it, but it includes this OHT. And then um, profits from the, the, the licensing arrangements are distributed by Operation Hat Trick to provide um, to services that support disabled veterans. It's, if you Google it, uh, it's a really phenomenal program. And truly one of our most successful uh, startup companies, too. Um, UNH Chems, it's an online chemical inventory management system. We use it for our own purposes. We've licensed it to other higher ed institutions, and we have trademarks on the name. Um, what else do we have? Bringing the bystander and know your power. Um, this is uh, it's an evidence-based program that shows the role that educated uh, bystanders can play in preventing sexual violence assaults on campus, also looking at um, implications for military installments as well. So we are doing, and Slick Pick, Brent Loy, I mentioned him earlier. These are, um, it's spineless summer squash, really important that genetic trait because uh, workers who are picking the vegetables, you know, the hands are protected by not getting, you know, by not having the spines on the squash. As well, the squash are protected from each other when you package them into a crate. So it improves the value of the squash when they're sold in a store. So we are doing both programs as well as, as um, products, as well as services, whether it's research or whether it's something outside of the institution. And of course, our relatively new logo, so. Trademarked. Some examples of UNH copyrights, non-software. Um, does anybody eat in the dining halls occasionally? You'll find these plates there that are in the center. And so that's an image that we are trying to license to other institutions so that they can have the plates in their dining halls but put their name in the center of it. I've been asking this. Has anybody seen Godzilla? I feel like I'm the only one. Our office is the only one. Well, go check out the, the most recent Godzilla movie. So this image is Jim Gardner and Andy Armstrong from um, our Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. They, produced the, they mapped and produced the first um, representation of the deepest part of the ocean, the Mariana Trench. So that's really amazing. They've created this image, we've had it, we've, we've publicized it, and so forth. Well, one day Warner Brothers called and they said, we'd like to license that image from you. And she said, huh. Okay, and so we were a little, you know, kind of curious. And we went back and forth, and we named a price, and they said no. And then we said, okay, attribution. They said no. You know, they're not going to do that in a film, which makes sense. Now that you know, we've been through this process, you can see the credits list would be pages upon pages. Um, so we went back to our original price, and they said fine. And so we licensed it to it. So if you go see Godzilla, we're like seven seconds, four seconds. It's a blip. <laughs> I totally missed it when we went to see it. I was just so excited to be at the movie theater. Never noticed it go by. But it's an awesome story for the university because you get to say, hey, did you know we're in Godzilla? Why would you be in Godzilla? Well, we have, these, um, we have this world-class center called the Center for Coastal and Ocean Mapping. We have folks there who are very talented. They made the first map of the deepest part of the ocean. Did you know this about UNH? So it's part of our research brand. It's a way of branding our investigators as well as the products that they do and to keep the name associated with that. So it's a, a very fun story. Lots and lots of software that we license and we're seeing this across multiple colleges so that's very encouraging. It's, um, I have just some of them listed up here but it's not for one purpose or, or one application but this is where open source and copyrights has become a very critical discussion for the university. So with that, um, resources, and there will be handouts. Or you might have received electronic copies of handouts last night. And it has a long list of resources, some of which I've duplicated here. They're kind of applicable to this discussion. 
um, as well as contact information from us. So I wanted to hijack part of this discussion about the IP policy to set the stage about why do, you, why do universities care about intellectual property, what are they doing about it, some of the tools they use, and why our policy has some of the look and feel and elements of it that it does. If you have any questions or specific questions or in general, I'm happy to answer them. If you just want to be done early and find more snacks, that's fine too. But thank you very much for your attention.